You're listening to the Mind Flipping Podcast, where you'll find tools and tips to help you renovate and update your mind and life. Dr. Steve, thanks for joining me for this uh, casual Ask a Mind Flipper conversation. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, connect with you again. Um, as you alluded to before we clicked record, it, it's, it has been a long, long time since we've chatted. Uh, um, it's been at least 48 hours. Something like that, yeah. And, and as we said, time has, has treated you well. Yes, you, you too. I mean, uh, yeah, when, it, when you go that long without seeing someone, a whole 48 hours, I mean, that's like, uh, you never know what could have gone on in their lives. So right. glad you're doing well still. Right. The partiers that we are, you know, it hits us hard. So uh. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> at this point, yeah, at a certain point, when we hit like 80 or 90, 48 hours could mean a whole lot of difference. <laughs> right. So for our listeners, yeah, we connected at the HPTI, the Hypnosis Practitioners Training Institute Winter Conference. And it's fantastic uh, to connect with other professionals. And, and, yeah. uh, and so in this Ask a Mind Flipper uh, bonus podcast we're going to kind of go over some questions that were submitted from listeners that were submitted to me from colleagues there at the conference and, and even okay. one or two of my own so are you ready to hop into it i am ready freddie let's do this all right so one of the questions that was handed to me or emailed to me i don't remember is just kind of your general uh impressions thoughts about the future of the field of hypnosis well it's interesting because um it was hosted by Richard Nongard and uh, also Jason Lynette. And Richard uh, had me talk to a class of his a couple weeks ago, uh, the separate from this, just a different class he was doing. And I, I made the comment that, you know, since I have a doctorate in education now, I'd like to lobby Congress to get standardization of credentialing for hypnotherapists. And he said, I don't think that'll ever happen. And I, I think that's a, a predominant view in hypnotherapy. Uh, that people do not actually think will get credentialing. So I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know the future, but I think that that will probably happen uh, because acupuncturists have it, uh, chiropractors have it. I think we talked about this last time that we we did an interview like this, that uh, we could really benefit from it because then you know, going at least in the United States, going from state to state, what to expect, what's the standard of care, and it's uh, and you're comparing apples to apples instead of apples to a basketball or who knows what because it sometimes just people create their own rules right and so what was his uh reasoning for saying hey, it's not going to happen yeah i was attempting to recall that just now it was something along the lines it was just a quick comment when we got sure. back on the other stuff but it was uh something along the lines uh I, yeah i I don't remember. I've heard so many, I've heard that so many times over the years and everybody has a slightly different reason. Yeah. For it. I don't recall what he said and I don't want to misquote him. Sure. Yeah. And I, I've heard him say that a few times as well. And so I, I can't recall it either. So <laughs> <laughs> next time we'll say, what is your reason? Let's yeah. Write it down. So we let's, remember. let's get it on, uh, on tape as they say. <laughs> That's right. Back in the day, you know, yeah. you get on real to real. That's right. Uh, so, have you seen the power of accreditation in other countries, other locales? Other countries? No, I, I, I'm sure they do have something like that, but I'm not really tuned in. I mostly focus on the United States and even that uh, we don't keep up state to state. When I train people in my certification program through the American Alliance of Hypnotists that I run, I tell them they're on their own for that. They should talk to an attorney in their state, find out what their credentialing requirements are. Uh, so I haven't really looked into that uh, globally and not even so much recently uh, locally in the United States. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, but as I, it, yep. I was gonna say, but as it compares to, like you said, uh, chiropractic work, acupuncture there, you can see the difference. Oh yeah. They, they've benefited tremendously because you know, they can bill insurance and that's a good thing. You know, it's it, hypnotherapists don't bill insurance usually unless they find some strange way to do it. And I think the reason is, you know, hip, insurance companies like to have codes, you know, this code means you're doing this procedure and with non uh, standardization, how do they know what this code means? Okay. It's that procedure, but how do you define that procedure? Because we define procedures differently. Right. So, yeah. Once we have that, I think uh, hypnotherapists will find they're more known, they're more accepted and they're making more money and they're able to bill insurance and they feel better about themselves. And the public feels better about them and everything will be better. 
I agree with you a hundred percent. But the thought of that process is way beyond <laughs> comprehension for how uh, that could happen. So I'm going to leave it up to smart people like you. Well, I was, I'm going to leave it up to Richard Nongard. So yeah. uh, <laughs> whatever his reason is, if he gets over it, then he can fix it for all of us. Right. I'll sign that document. Here's a little money. Um, I support. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll give a few bucks to it and sign on the, on the list that gets submitted. Yeah. I, I would be happy to spearhead this thing and, and go talk before Congress or whatever it takes. But we, we do have to have a meeting of the minds. We have to have a lot of people get together and have a consensus of people who are considered to be leaders in the field. And then we have to do that and uh, I think really what it's going to take which is what most laws take is something going wrong you know someone realizing that uh, hey this would be a good idea to have standardization of credentialing yeah if only it had been or would be standardized this wouldn't have happened exactly exactly and then we will have it set forevermore right so related to that you know the, the future of hypnosis how long have you been in it I've been involved in hypnosis since about 1982. If we go all the way back to my high school days when I first started hypnotizing my roommates. That's and right. And as a, as a grown up person since about 1985. Nice. How about you? Uh, about 10 years. Yeah, about 10 years. And so you've got a couple of years on me. And in that time, yeah, a little bit, give or take. Have you, uh, I'm sure you've seen changes. And so as so many things, you know, you're a pioneer in so many ways and uh, through internet marketing and your ability to get the word out about the power of hypnosis. What do you see changing uh, in this field, perception wise, getting the word out in any way? I see the, let's see, what do I see? What else do I see changing? Um, I think I believe just the things I mentioned, I'm not able to think of any others right now. Just uh, It'll be just better all the way around for the reasons I mentioned. Um, we'll, see, we'll also get this, the benefit in addition to uh, what I said before, we'll also get the benefit of, you know, people setting that as an aspiration when they're a child. Uh, you know, like I want to be a doctor. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a hypnotherapist, you know. You know, maybe daddy or mommy or daddy is a hypnotherapist. They go to the office. They're respected in the community. They're able to pay the mortgage and the bills by, by doing that. They're able to support themselves. I want to do that. It will give me, it will give my life meaning. So I think we'll see a lot of, a lot of that. A trickle down that way. That makes perfect sense. Awesome. I love it. All right. Uh, let's see. Another question that was submitted. Uh, actually, a couple were uh, more on the marketing side because you're uh, so proficient at marketing. Uh, one of the questions was, do you have a recommendation for the fastest way to build a good list? So, uh, you know. A, not a bad list? Yeah, you know, like uh, a lot of numbers, you know, not like, you know, high, you know, qu uh, quantity, but also quality. Well, uh, quality is all about screening. You know, make sure, you need to make sure they know what list they're getting on and why. And that's also a legal requirement. Yeah. And uh, the UK has come down with uh, what they call the GDPR or something along those lines. Yeah. I forget what, it's, what it means, but for about six months there, everyone in the world was kind of, you know, very focused on that. We all yeah. knew everything about it and we all got it and applied it how it fits to our websites and, and we're good and hopefully we can forget about it and they won't ever give us any trouble uh, right. because what happened is the UK came up with some very stringent guidelines about how you can opt people in you have to and, and how you can communicate with them and store their data and it's good stuff but their fines are really heavy I mean 25 uh, million dollars is the minimum fine I think something like that. something ridiculous yeah yeah that's not even adjusted for the exchange rate. Right? I think it's actually more I think it's yeah it might even be more in American dollars but anyway it's ridiculous and nobody wants it so nobody wants well no I, I think people want the rules I think the UK citizens do but nobody wants the fine uh, but they do have a series of warnings they said they would give first and they're only after the big fish to set examples of them and uh, that hasn't even happened yet so good and, I think um, 
uh, the, the way to build a quality list is by following rules like they have. I mean, they are ultimately good rules. You're letting someone know what they're getting involved in and that they're going to hear from you and the part of an email list. If you trick people into an email list and you don't tell them they're getting on an email list and you start sending them emails, well, they can report you for spam and there's the canned spam laws that we have here in the United States. I believe they're federal laws. So I believe you could potentially go to federal prison for that. Um, I don't think anyone would, but you know, it's on the books and it's a hammer that the law can use. So I think if you follow their lead, uh, you'll find that you're getting a more curated list of people who know the, know where they are. And uh, also by how you, uh, you know, Presuasion is a new book, a newer book by um, uh, Cialdini over in Arizona, the uh, Robert Cialdini, he's a psychologist. And uh, he, he wrote a book called Persuasion. All the marketers use that to make a bunch of money persuade people to <laughs> buy things. And then he wrote persuasion. Now persuasion, he says, is just as important as persuasion, or maybe more important, but uh, it's the idea of what do they encounter before something happens? Like before they opt into your list, what do they encounter? And that's important too in building a quality list. Do they see a quality presentation of you and your website and who you are, your persona? Or do they just see some, I don't know, maybe some cheesy opt-in page that's not well done and doesn't, you know, inspire anyone? Well, you know, it matters. Certain people go to certain types of places. Certain types of people go to certain websites and opt into certain things. So these are all things that are within your control. Persuasion. So we'll put a link in that, in, uh, to that in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great book. Great book. Yeah, excellent. I'll check it out. And so what I hear you saying is being, uh, transparent, being authentic, being very clear about your offering. Yes. Yes. If you want to have a clean list, that's not just a bunch of people who you tricked into being there who really don't want to hear from you. And you're hoping that even though they don't, maybe some of them will and they'll actually buy something. You know, it's not the way to do it. Just clear communication and being honest. That's, that's a good way to get the quality there. That doesn't handle the quantity. Uh, that can actually lower the quantity and increase the quality. Right. So when you talk about increasing the quantity, you just need a greater reach, you know, social media, it's free, like I was talking about yesterday in my class that I did for Richard Nogard's uh, organization. The the reach that you can get with social media is free. You know, at this time, it's uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and uh, we've got a few other things, and that they'll they'll continue to be more things. And of course, MySpace went away. So on the other end, things will die off. I I think MySpace, as I was saying in class yesterday, MySpace might come back because the corduroy jeans came back. So. Sure. So like MySpace might also come on MySpace. I have 7,000 followers on MySpace and nobody goes there. I want them to come back. Is it still up at like, is it? Yeah, is I still have yeah. an active MySpace. I check it every now and then just for fun. And I, you know, the pictures I put on there are still there. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. It's like a, one of those old West mining towns that is now just, you know, nobody's there. <laughs> Tumbleweeds blowing through my <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of what it's like, but it's intact. So uh, unfortunately, I had to fly out. I didn't catch your uh, talk, but I, I think I remember in the past that um, you have resources, uh, uh, programs. Um, I mean, we didn't plan in a pitch here or anything, but do you have something on that side on, on building uh, products or marketing, or am I imagining? I do. I do. Absolutely. Yeah. At my website, stevegjones.com, uh, first thing you'll see is you can get a free hypnosis download for wealth. So might as well get that. Uh, that. And that opts you into my email list. And it's clear that that's what's happening on there. But if you go to uh, hypnosis programs, you'll see that we have one for marketing yourself as a hypnotherapist. And that's something that I, that's hours of uh, video that I recorded from a class that I, that I did about that. And I show I show everything from A to Z, how to market yourself online. Awesome. And I would assume that it's applicable to other similar service. Yeah, exactly. Chiropractors, acupuncturists, because it's the same techniques. Marketing uh, these kinds of services. When I say these kinds, I mean outside of the mainstream type services is pretty much the same for acupuncturists, chiropractors, massage therapists, Reiki masters, hypnotherapists, NLP practitioners, all of them. Very cool. Awesome. We'll put that link in the show notes as well. Okay, excellent. Yeah. All right. Another question here. Let's see. Um, oh, it's kind of similar. It was uh, wondering about changes in the last few years, in the last few years, and perhaps in the upcoming years in marketing. And perhaps you touched on that in your class about social media. Any, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, it's a moving target. I mean, I'll bet since we've been talking here in this interview, it's changed because it's just, it's all code and they've got coders, you know, an army of them. All of these social media platforms have an army, and their individual army or armies of coders who are constantly upgrading. Of course, the purpose is to make more money. Uh, but the thing is that in order for them to make more money, they have to create a tool that's more usable and better. So they're constantly refining, and that's the beauty of capitalism. Everyone has to compete and get better and better all the time. There's no, there's no free lunch. There's no state subsidized, you know, income. You have to compete against the other person. So they're always working on it. Uh, some of the things that have changed recently, as of now, uh, Instagram has uh, Instagram Stories. We're just working on figuring out some of this stuff ourselves. Yeah. Uh, Facebook Live seems to have is still active. Seems that maybe it's kind of died down a little bit and. You got uh, Instagram stories kind of rising up, but who knows? I mean, Facebook Live is still, people still use it. I saw people using it and even putting videos of, of me both singing uh, karaoke and I think yourself too singing karaoke on Facebook Live and uh, as well as actual class stuff on there. So people still use it. People still look at it. So it is a good thing, and uh, but it's constantly changing. It's a moving target. Yeah, so... I know the big push is, and, and as a consumer, video is nice, you know, and it's all about video, whether it's, you know, Facebook Live. That's becoming big. Yeah, video is expected by the analysts to the people who look at how much money these places are making and see what they can do that'll increase that money. They see video becoming huge. It's not going away. It's just getting bigger and better. Now, one interesting thing is virtual reality. I thought that was going to be big, but if you look at Google Trends, it kind of peaked at a certain point, then it started dropping. I thought it was going to be the next best thing, but it turned out it wasn't, at least not yet. So I guess people don't like to, maybe we get augmented reality because then you can see where you're going and watch something at the same time. But I, I thought virtual reality would would be bigger. So we were going to launch a whole virtual reality project. We decided not to because the, the conversions, as we say, weren't there. Yeah. The people buying the stuff that just, there wasn't a substantial market for it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I know a lot of people are investing a lot of money and time or have been around that. Um, but yeah, I like your perspective. Maybe that augmented will be the, uh, the way to kind of get it cranked back up. Yeah, maybe. I mean, when the Oculus Go launched it, and you can look on uh, Google Trends. It's a free tool. You can Google Google Trends and, and type in uh, virtual reality hypnosis or virtual reality period, and you'll see that it it it, it spiked and peaked when the Oculus Go was released. That was the last big virtual reality uh, move Hardware. forward. Okay. And then it just phew, right back down. Huh. Interesting. How about uh, speaking of video, um, YouTube Live, is that? I've never done it. I've had friends who did it who didn't recommend it. Um, I, I think that, I, have you done it? I haven't. You know, I know it's there and I always kind of wondered because it's part of the uh, uh, behemoth that uh, uh, Google is. You know. Yeah, Google's kind of let their, Google's kind of becoming not really, I mean, uh, YouTube's kind of becoming not quite MySpace, but they're really not, I mean, there's some things they need to do engineering wise uh, on there that uh, just haven't been done that it hasn't been updated in a long time. So I don't know, I don't think they're going to let that go because it was the original, but there are newer and more fascinating forms of video now that people are leaning toward. Yeah. Um, you know, like um, IGTV, Instagram TV, you know, people are leaning toward that now. And YouTube's being, it's still there. I think it'll probably always be there, but uh, I haven't put much effort into it and I haven't done any live stuff because I just, I've heard that it's just not very helpful in terms of leading people to find out about the help that you have to offer them. Okay. Yeah. And it seems like YouTube is investing, promoting, putting their money towards, uh, shows, uh, live sports and, Oh, okay. You know, I, I see them marketing that, you know, almost I don't like want sports on in there. Yeah. Almost like a cable channel. You can watch this here, this series. I think there are series on there. I don't know. Oh, okay. So yeah, they're taking on that model. The Netflix you know, kind of. Right. Yeah. Netflix. And I think that there are a few others. That's a highly competitive market. Yeah. That's a good market to go after. That market has legs. I mean, they can make some money off of that and people will use that. 
Um, the thing I don't like to see, the, the downside of capitalism is you go into the grocery store and there are 50 kinds of cereal or what have you. Uh, and uh, like in that, in that movie, I forget what movie that was, but a guy comes back from war and he, he's freaked out by all the different types of cereal. So you get all these platforms offering videos, you know, okay, great. Now, which one do I choose? Which one's the best one? So, uh, but you know, they are competing, but at this point, I think they're all kind of sort of equal, but I'm not able to tell because it's a moving target. Too early to tell Yep. who's going to rise. Yep. All right. Um, a couple of questions that uh, I'm going to sneak in that actually come from me. Okay. Uh, I had a, a conversation. In fact, by the time this podcast goes live, um, my podcast with Martin Peterson should have gone live. And Martin and I talked about past lives. He had a past life uh, regression experience. That's how he got into the field. And um, I think you offer some training or a product in that, right? Yes. We have a past life regression certification program. And I wrote a book about past life regression. And I did that, did a past life regression with Danny Bonaducci from uh, the. Oh. From back in the day, yeah, he was. That was fun. Did that uh, about uh, ten years ago, I guess. And uh, yeah, so I. That's one thing that initially got me into it. I was interested in past lives when I get into hypnosis as a kid. So I do. Uh, I do remember now that you mentioned that about uh, Danny Bonaduce. Uh, so uh, I guess my question is, you know, uh, what are your thoughts, feelings, experiences, explanations about that? Well, uh, the older I get, the more I feel that I am becoming a um, more of a pragmatic type person, uh, more of an existentialist. You know, life is void of meaning except what you give it. Uh, this may be the only one we have for all we know. I've always said about past life regression, and I even said this in the first sentence of the book I wrote on it, it may or may not be real. However, there's tremendous therapeutic value in it. If someone goes back to a past life or thinks they're going back to a past life and they are relieved of something they're suffering from in this life because of it, in my opinion, as someone who's a healer, yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't care as long as they're relieved of it. The actual proving of it, the actual investigation of it, there's a book called, I think it's called Across Time and Death. Uh, a lady who was in Mensa, you know, where all the smart people go, the high IQ people, I think she was in that. And she um, says that and offers evidence supporting that she was alive. I think it was maybe in the 1920s, had, had five kids or so, died. And then those kids continued living and grew up. And about 1985, she did a past life regression, found out where she lived before, the kids she had, she was able to track them down, if I'm remembering the book correctly. So we do have occasionally things like that. My, my opinion is, I don't know. I have right. no idea. Okay. As, a, as a healer, I also don't care. It, it's, there's therapeutic value, and I teach that in my program, and I teach that in my book. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Well, first of all, I think that was it aligns with Martin's uh, thoughts, you know, that he doesn't know the answers and it doesn't really matter that there is therapeutic value in it. It benefited him and he's seen it benefit, you know, yep. hundreds of, of people. And uh, I would agree. Um, I, just, I think it's fascinating. I don't incorporate it into my practice. I think it's fascinating. The stories, Martin's story, if our listeners haven't heard, I have to check it out. I think he's uh, episode 72 perhaps. And uh, he kind of validated in, in person, his, his experience where he, uh, I guess the summary was he went and in his past life, he saw himself as a, a, a teenager, a Jewish boy in Nazi Germany. And he saw uh, his death and, mm. uh, and, and remembered so many details that he had written down afterwards. And he uh, living in Denmark drove the six hours to Berlin and, and verified these things he saw that he had, would have no way of, experiencing before and, and then we read books wow. about it. there's one in the news recently a young boy who uh loved planes and uh was connected to all these details of of a past fighter pilot or something and so it's hard to explain um i don't have the explanation um i think it's just it's yeah it's fascinating and i think uh for the right person and you know it's it's a great option a, a great avenue to explore absolutely and it's fascinating too. When I had someone hypnotize me when I was 16 and I, I started studying past life regression, I had someone hypnotize me and found out I was, or, you know, quote unquote was yeah. uh, a Viking warrior, uh, a 
a painter in France and some kind of hand surgeon uh, somewhere. So those things are pretty cool. They made me feel really good about myself. So there's that value, even if they didn't happen. And I may never know whether they happen or not. Yeah, that is. I mean, just that sense of what if uh, a feeling of that's part of me or at one point it was, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's in your head. I mean, it, you know, whether you lived it or not, it came from your head. So it's in there. Yeah. So the next question, and uh, I don't know if this will make sense. It kind of relates to this, uh, the past lives. Um, and this question kind of arose recently. I was listening to a book, uh, boy, <laughs> like you, I'm having trouble. Listening remembering. to a book. That's what I do too. I don't even read them anymore. I've got audible on my, on my iPhone and I just, download everything and listen to it that's what i do and and being that this is a relaxed uh chill and chat i'm gonna pause and and look for the title on my book uh, okay i spend some time on the road and and uh have time to listen so this is by michael pollan <laughs> as it starts how to change your mind what the new science of psychedelics teach us about consciousness dying addiction depression and transcendence psychedelics yeah so um it's called how to change your mind how to change your mind yeah by michael pollan he's a best-selling author p-o-l-l-a-n and we'll put that link in the show notes as well and he's written a lot of uh, other books that, and so the question that he kind of just throws out and i haven't gotten all the way through the book is where so a lot of people feel that our, our our awareness or consciousness comes from our mind our brain um, but it, is it, you know, the question is, where is the source of conscience, consciousness? And when people have a psychedelic experience or a near death experience where their brain is dead, yet they saw their death and it floated above the operating room floor, makes you wonder where is that awareness come from? Hmm. Yep. Any uh, thoughts on that? Have you, have you, delved down that rabbit hole I, I was waiting for you to tie it into psychedelics but uh i yeah I, I guess i'll have to read the book but uh yeah I, i've had experiences like that and uh, i don't know if again if they were absolute if they were whatever reality is right i have had experiences like that um does that book talk about the the you know back in the 60s and 70s and even um in the 80s when i was in high school the kids were into LSD, but, you know, taking large amounts of it, like, um, you know, a minimum of 75 micrograms. Now they're taking, they're doing this thing called microdosing, where they're taking like maybe 10 micrograms or less. And does the book talk about that kind of stuff? It does. Yeah. It's a very thorough history of psychedelics um, from the person who founded, uh, you know, discovered LSD almost accidentally. And Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hoffman, I think it was. And his yeah. bicycle ride home. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah, and they get into the mushrooms and the author, you know, his tests and the different mushrooms and how uh, psilocybin, you know, is, is the, the big, uh, uh, I guess, agent or whatever you call it. They've been uh, touting that in California for a long time. You have all these uh, yogi type uh, people who I'm not remembering any now, but there are a lot of famous ones around, I think they're around the Berkeley area who are teaching in the 60s and 70s and talking about psilocybin and their experiences and yeah, who knows? I, I don't know if any of it's real, but they do seem to say that there's some value in it. Yeah, I know uh, Tim Ferriss is is into those studies, if you will. Um, he had, has been open about his struggles with uh, depression and suicidal thoughts and and the possibilities of offering relief through um, psychedelics. So. I don't know. You know, the the book talks about the political implic implications on Nixon really shut everything down, and um, from the studies and how it kind of sounds like you know there's a, enough people behind it that the benefits of those um, psychedelics uh, may come into mainstream. It's probably going to be a while, but yeah, the, yeah. The research was shut down. I, I, you're right. After the like 50s and 60s, they were very much into it. They're into hypnosis research quite a bit too. Even Stanford and Harvard, all the big universities 
were into these things and the psychedelics and hypnosis. And then it did kind of just die off and got shut down and then, yeah, the war on drugs and what have you. But uh, it is coming back. All, all of that's coming back. And psychedelics are coming back in a big way. I guess since they're legalizing marijuana in all the states, they're, uh, they figure they're okay experimenting with uh, psychedelics also. And there is the potential for some kind of, again, we talk about standardization. If we can get you know, real scientists studying this, not hippies in a garage, right. making it and tripping and having their neighbors trip, then um, maybe we can find, you know, what is the therapeutic dosage and then we can standardize the chemicals so they know what they're getting. Even ayahuasca, there's somebody in uh, Brazil studying that on a scientific level. Same attempt, you know, help people make it therapeutic, but, you know, standardize it. Yeah. It's interesting. It's just popping into my, my, my mind now. I, as things are circling back, there was a, uh, a series on YouTube. Um, I think it's called the mind field. And again, one of the things I do while I'm traveling, if I'm not listening to audible, I'm watching uh, some videos. I can't find it right now, but I think it was called mind field. It's a short series. And there is an episode where the host, I think perhaps travels to Brazil and goes through a psychedelic experience uh, to your point, a very, uh, supervised, measured, monitored experience. And uh, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of people like there's a place in Kentucky, uh, I think they call it Kentucky Ayahuasca. They have a series on YouTube and uh, people go there. Uh, it's a religion. It's, you know, according to the federal government, it's a legitimate religion, but they, people go there with psychological issues and they give them ayahuasca. And uh, as far as I know, there's no medical doctor there. There's no trained therapist there. There's no emergency crew huh. there. You know, they've got nothing. But under in America, you know, under the guise of, I should say guys, under, you know, it being an actual religion, right. uh, they're allowed to do that. So there's that part. And then there's the scientific part, like the guy in Brazil. Um, I, I would lean more toward the scientific part because I, I think – People can get lucky and help people, and that can be a benefit. But, you know, again, standardization. Like, do you even know what you did that worked? Do you even know what was in the mixture that time or which leaves you used or how much? Or are you kind of winging it each time? Yeah, it's got to be driven by data. You know, you got to be able to measure it. And, yep. Yeah, to duplicate it. Fascinating. Good. So uh, I guess a couple of uh, final questions, uh, lighter questions before we wrap things up. Um, on uh, travel side, being that you get around the world, do you have any favorite uh, travel destinations? I like uh, New Zealand. I went there for the first time a few months ago. That was awesome. And uh, Queenstown in particular, that anyone who's been, have you been to? I haven't, it? nope, haven't been to that side of the world. Yeah, uh, yeah. I heard it's, it's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I've got a lot of friends at Christchurch. So I went to a wedding there, but then we flew down to Queenstown for fun and, and learning. It was a mastermind, so that was great. Uh, Barcelona, or Barcelona, as they say it. Spain, oh, yeah. uh, very nice. Yeah, right on the water there. And the architecture of Gaudi, which is just amazing. I mean, it's... Gaudi? Is, it, is that Spain Gaudi. as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's architecture there. Have you seen it or no. heard of it? Okay, it's just, it's hard to describe. If you Google it, you'll see what I mean. It's, it's almost like you're looking at, at cartoons but they're real. I mean, he built cathedrals that look like they, they shouldn't even be, they kind of look like that you ever have, um, not sea monkeys, but the other stuff. When I was a kid, you get a, a bowl and you drop the stuff and it kind of builds like a yeah. blue castle yeah. and a green castle. Yeah. It kind of yeah. almost looks like that, but it's real and it's huge and it's a cathedral. And it was 150 years ago and none of it's done yet because he never finished anything. It's all like, you know, almost done with the scaffolding there. But uh, it's, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's one of my favorite places. That's a good description because I think I've seen it as you're, you know. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, how do you, do you know how you spell it? Gaudi. I think it's G-A-U-D-I. I have okay. to guess. That's All right. I so we'll try to put a link to uh, photos or videos in, in the show. Yeah. He's like uh, uh, Dali, Salvador Dali. He's a, uh, you know, Spanish guy who was, really good at innovative and cool stuff. Maybe they had some of those drugs over there back then. Who knows? Something probably, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and lastly, speaking of destinations and the fact that you're a resident of, and we just saw you in Vegas, any uh, hidden secrets of Vegas? Any uh, tips for people that visit? <laughs> well, it looks like the real estate's going to keep going up because I heard, I didn't hear this from a local. I heard this from someone visiting that they're buying a baseball team now. Oh, wow. 
know, yeah, when Vegas buys things, like you may have seen the hockey team they put together, they, they, they can get some good stuff because Vegas has uh, lots of money. We, we get to, there's a gaming tax. Anytime people gamble, there's a cut. And then for, for us, you know, citizens, the residents, so we have nice roads and nice everything. So when we build it, it's, it's built well and it's built right. So it's getting bigger and better. Um, of course, it is a, um, a town, a city that is dependent upon tourism. So in an economic pullback, which who knows when it will happen, Ray Dalio says there's 33% chance of recession in the next two years. Who knows? Right. But it does kind of go down then. Uh, so let's see. What else do I know? What's a, another secret of Vegas? A lot of people don't know about the people living underground. There are a lot of people underground here, uh, who the homeless people, and some of them are drug addicts, not like microdosing you know college students but right. heroin addicts and stuff yeah the hardcore they're in trouble type addicts and there's a lot of that unfortunately going on they live in the drainage systems wow. under the strip so yeah you're visiting the strip there are people underground not too far from there who are living their lives had no idea uh isn't there a uh a prominent businessman who was doing something to the downtown area and, and perhaps for yeah, homeless yeah. people yeah tony shea Okay. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if that's who you mean, but the guy who owned Zappos and he sold it to yes. Amazon but still worked for them. Yeah, he started buying up a bunch of or investing in a lot of businesses. He started something called Container Park. Uh, he's good. got a lot of cool stuff going on there. That's where the if you're hip and you're you're into that and you're okay with a little bit of homeless people walking around type stuff, then downtown might be the place for you because it is it, that's where the cutting edge is. That's where you got a lot of the young tech people and the hip people doing really cool stuff. Interesting. Very cool. Awesome. Well, we covered a lot. So, uh, yeah, thank yeah. thanks. We covered the mind. We covered traveling. Uh, uh, wow. We were everywhere. Psychedelic. Around the world in uh, a very brief period of time. I like it. In 30 minutes. Well, thanks, Dr. Steve. Thanks for taking the time to uh, reconnect and, uh, and share your uh, insights, your wisdom. Rick, it's my pleasure and great seeing you. And as I was telling you, I'll, I'll say it on here also, you are an awesome person and the, the calmness that you have and, and the understanding that you have of people. It's like, anytime I talk to you, I just feel like this guy gets me. He understands people. He's a calm, confident, compassionate person I can trust. So, so thank you for being you. I appreciate that so much. Thank you very much. And, and uh, again, listeners, head over to mindflipping.com for all the links, including uh, um, Dr. Steve's connections and, uh, and programs. Thanks, Dr. Steve. Be well. You too, Rick. Thank you. Thanks.